and I got by him and he hit me in the bumper and like almost like tried to spin me out in the next corner. But Teddy had blown up and he was the first one to my car because I finished second to Eric. And they make top three stop with the front stretch and he come around and he's like, that's your fucking buddy. That's your fucking buddy. Now you know, now you know what we all deal with. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ryan Flores, and this is the Derek Pernasiglio Show. Can I drive you? Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the show with the guy with the long last name. But you don't have to worry about my last name. You have to worry about the name of the guest. And we have Ryan Skip Flores joining us. He is a Gambler's Classic winner, a TQ Indoor Allentown champion, uh, won the Rumble in the Dome uh, now you're racing modifieds at Bowman Gray Stadium, and then oh yeah, you also work on Sundays for a championship cup team with Ryan Blaney. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, yeah, I got a lot going on, but yeah, just racing, man. Stacking penny shows. Well, yeah. what is it? NASCAR coast to coast around the track. Yeah, it's, it's been yeah, I got a lot going on, yeah. and more importantly, two kids at home and a wife. So that's you know, it's making making sure that uh, get enough free time to make sure they uh, am present in their life so that's yeah it's, there's a lot to juggle right now and i and i forgot one of the other ones you own a powder coating company as well yeah so. yeah thank god i got good employees there they they run that place and uh they do a good job but yeah it's been a lot of fun too how do you juggle everything just keep the first they re really the tire changing deal is is i've gotten to a place in my career where that's the first thing right that's that's what feeds my family mm. um and it's so hard right now i know we went to one lug nut, but it's just, it's each week. It's super physical. It's really hard. And at the level that we're at, at the level Ryan runs at and that Penske's at, it's like, you got to be really tapped in. Uh, so making sure that that's always the first thing, especially when the playoffs come around. Um, and then the guys at the powder, like really with the powder coat shop, I just have three great employees, Cody, Scott, and Clay that run that place um, and, and make it, you know, pretty seamless for me that I just have to, come there when there's a, like, I just have to solve the problems when they come up and they, they solve 90% of them. So I just have to solve 10% of them. And then the race and stuff, like it's just Mondays go in there and bullshit with my buddy Corey that we're going to do anyway. <laughs> right. You might as well just record it. Right. And then it's been really good at NASCAR to get, you know, with Kim and, and behind the, behind the mic and behind the camera to figure out how all that, how all that uh, works. And yeah, I don't know, man, but at the end of the day, we're just racing. That's what we're going to be doing anyway. So you might as well film it. So what does a week consist of for you? Like after Sunday, uh, obviously you fly back from whatever race you're at. Then yeah. what's the first thing you do Monday morning? Bring my kid to kindergarten. Well, usually I get punched in the face by one of my kids. <laughs> Wake <laughs> okay. up, dad. Uh, and so then, your dad. Okay, and then, on Monday. you know, we go, I, my kids, my, my daughter goes to school in Mooresville. So I, we live in Huntersville, which is close to Charlotte. And then Mooresville, where she goes to school, is close to Penske. So I drop her off kindergarten and I'll usually... Uh, either going to Penske for a workout or go over to LaJoy's and work out um, in the gym there at the seat shop. And then we'll do stacking pennies on Monday. And then Monday afternoon, I'll do whatever needs to be done. Uh, Tuesdays, it's pit practice. Same thing, kindergarten in the morning. Uh, drop off and then pit practice uh, from about 9 till uh, noon, 1 o'clock. And then I go over and do, we just want to film around the track at NASCAR. So every and, day of the week, there's at least one pit practice for you guys. Uh, yeah, well, Mondays and Fridays we have off, um, oh, okay. but I'll work out. Like we still have workouts on the board. Um, our trainer, Nate puts up, so I'll try to hit them. They're usually really good to kind of flush out the stuff from Sunday. So kind of like a, like a reset workout. Um, right. it's good. As How just different move. is that for you? Because I, you know, you're a short track kid, j just like me. Um, a lot of these guys that are going over the wall now are former Division One athletes, former NFL yeah. players. Like you are now having to compete with guys who played in football, baseball. You know, all all of them. Yeah. What, what is that like for you? I tell I tell those guys quite a bit. Like uh, Josh, who changes front tires for I use him as an example quite a bit. He changes front tires for Suarez. He won the Super Bowl with the Broncos. Like playing. Not so they. These guys are real deal athletes. And if I had to restart my career today, I wouldn't make it. Mm. But the reason that I was able to be successful as a tire changer was not off of my talent. It was because I could build the race cars too. And I was an asset, you know, as a fabricator, as a mechanic, I could fill in as a tire guy. So I hung around long enough to then be good enough and be better than, you know, the next guy to get the opportunity to be on the pit crew. So it, it was because I was a racer that I was able to do it. If I had to do it just off my athleticism alone, I wouldn't make it. Um, <laughs> 
very much not what those guys are. But, you know, I've seen a little bit of like the like racers be frustrated that it's football guys or D1 guys. But what I could say in my experience, I've learned as much from them that they've learned from me on the racing side, like whether it be working out nutrition or just like, you know, if you're a D1 football player, you play in the NFL, you're a pretty high level human being. Right. Right. So like, I, like I learn a lot from the guys that I'm around and then even the younger guys that come to the sport, I'm able to teach them like, Hey, this is how the sport works. This is kind of how we act in that situation. This is how we don't act in the situation. This is how, you know, successful guys approach a race. And I've just learned that from years of being in the sport. So it's, it works twofold. You know, we, it's, it's just like any good relationship that I get some, get really good stuff from them. They get really good stuff from me. But for now, you are an over the wall guy. You don't go into the shop and work every day anymore, right? You no, have your I own did that for and... I did that for twelve or thirteen years. Yeah, mm -hmm. I started at Roush as a fabricator at nineteen. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was drinking through a fire hose there. I got a job. I don't know how I got hired there, but building cup cars at nineteen uh, in the finish fab shop. And yeah, it was really talented people. Um, but then I was there, left there to pursue the tire would go like just out to the pit practice area at lunchtime and after work and just hit lug nuts till my knuckles bled um and they weren't going to give me a, a shot there to be a tire changer they kind of told me that they they said hey you're a really great fabricator and you could be a road mechanic one day but I was like I want to do this tire changing gig so Bobby Hutchins was actually at Stuart Haas and going back in time we used to come down here and race the smart tour with Hot Pockets so I knew Bobby a little bit and he hired me as the first backup at Stuart Haas, and man, that was cool. On whose who's car, Tony's? So I was the only tire change and backup, but because it just goes back, like I th everything's been connected. So Darren Grubb was at Hendrick, Steve Berg and Satch, who were guys from the junkyard in Jersey. Mm -hmm. Steve Bergie, you, you know Bergie, his, his son raced for a while, Allison Legacy Cars and Bandoleros, but he is in charge of all their Speedway stuff. Mm-hmm. And when I went there, unbeknownst to me, he had called Darian Grubb and said, hey, that kid's a good kid. And Darian said, hey, anybody that Steve Burke says is a good kid, I need to have on my team, so I'd love to have you come. So I started just going as a backup. Then by the end of the year there in 2011, I was going, I was in the aero department, so I was a fabricator, and I'd go to the wind tunnel, and um, we'd just build, we'd run out of time. It was me and this dude, Scotty Robinette. Uh, he's, he's a badass. He's like one of the unsung heroes of the garage, right? He was on the 30, he was one of Banjo Matthews guys. He was on the 33 Skull Bandit car. Wow. Then he, he was, did that whole deal. Like when they went from, uh, front steer, like rear steer cars and change it from bias plies to radials. Then he carried tires for one of Earnhardt's championships. And then he went, he was at Everham's and kind of started that deal. And he's been at Stuart Haas for a long time. He's like one of the baddest, the most badass guys, but you would never know it. Right. Like the best guys you don't really know. Right. They're not the loudest. Um, so yeah, I got to, I was there and then I started at Penske. Um, I left store house kind of for the opportunity to be, uh, for a better opportunity at Penske. And, uh, I was there, I've been there for 10 years now and I was in the shop for seven, um, working on the, like the pull down rigs and the seven post and then kind of building the pit boxes in the winter. What was the goal during that time? Was the goal to be an over the wall guy was it to be a crew chief or what, what was the goal for you it changed time? um when i first moved here right like i just wanted to race and i wanted to be a i want to be a crew chief i want to be a driver i want to be everything right like like we all do when we're kids but um i knew that i was never like i raced i drove a lot but i knew i was never going to be a driver because i didn't have any funding or like mm -hmm. any chance to do that uh so i was like i'll be a car that my the first guy that was um one of the first front tire changers I worked with was a guy named Todd Ziegler, who uh, was a car chief and a front changer. So he did both. Cause like that was kind of the position Justin Nottestead was the same way. He was on the 17. Uh, they were really like, he was like killer B like they were badass, but the car chief was usually the front changer at the same time. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. I'll be the car chief and the front changer. And then obviously the role has changed to where you have to pick an Avenue. And it wasn't until, I remember the, like the exact time when I, cause I still like was never, even when I went to Stuart Haas, I was never like on a clear cut trajectory to be a tire changer. It was like, I did both went on the road and I changed tires and like 
I would do the trucks and Xfinity. I would go and do like happy hour and work on the car and sling springs with those guys. But then I would go like change and do the truck race and change and do the Arca race or change and, you know, put my fire suit on and go do Robbie Benton's Xfinity car. Um, and I was rooming with Jeff Mendering, Jabbo, who is the crew chief for Chandler Smith now okay. on the, at Gibbs. Mm-hmm. And he told me, he's like, man, you might want to like look into doing the picker stuff. He's like, because if you're going to have kids, it was when I met my wife, Carissa. It's like, you're going to have kids and stuff, man. I like, I miss a lot of stuff. And that's kind of the conversation I had with him. Um, he was, I remember we would just room together and it wasn't like one distinct conversation, but he was like, yeah, he, he had said that he was bummed out because his kid didn't do as, as well as baseball when he had a busy week. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, if I'm, if I got an opportunity to just kind of work, you know, a couple of days a week and pit this thing, I need to take that. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the avenue I went. So doing it this way gives you more time with your family. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, it's not, especially now the schedule's way different, but back then, I mean, you were flying out Thursday, getting back late Sunday night and you were working. I mean, the garage hours were pretty, pretty heavily, you know, in, like, I don't know, you were in the garage 10, 12 hours a day. And it's as a, a car chief, you're, you're the first one there and the last one to leave, you know, other than a crew chief, you're, you're all the way in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, once I met Chris and it became clear that, you know, we were going to have a family and I was getting married. It, it's like, okay got a good opportunity with changing tires so i got to pursue that but it hasn't always been it's not the it's not the easiest you know profession and you don't just choose it like you got to be good enough to do it dude i've tried changing tires before and this was just at the short track level for a late model team and you guys have got balls because to jump out there with all those cars flying around you and to just concentrate on looking at the lug nut and to tune all of those cars flying around you out that takes guts because and, and i mean and we've seen it at any moment all it takes is one guy getting turned around or something and yeah it's uh my rear changer now is though got is steve or zach price is the one that got hit on pit road at indy and broke his leg when they all got sandwiched down there on, on blaney's car so yeah it's yeah I, that's like have you ever been hurt or hit yet been hurt yeah. um but not i've been hit but not like harvick clipped me a couple times but like when i was sitting down he'd like clip my heel he would always run you a little tight. Some of them older guys yeah. would, would play those games, but now there's rules and there's, you know, interference penalties. And it's, it's not something that, um, it's not like a part of the job you think about is getting hit quite a bit, mm-hmm. but it does happen. Right. No, I understand it. Just having, just having to tune that out because you're seeing all the, the cars in your peripheral vision and, yeah, I, I, I've done it a couple of times. I got hit. Actually, I rolled up the... the, the what kind the, of car? The late model. Okay. Somebody coming on... The modifies are the worst. I oh, won't yeah. do them. I won't do because there's no fender. Right. Yeah, yeah. that was the, the closest I've come to getting hit. Me and Corey... <laughs> me and Corey were in Florida early, and we went over to New Smyrna, and Hot Pockets talks in the change of tires for Jerry Bertucci like 15 years ago. <laughs> And I about got cleaned out. Like I had just gotten <laughs> on, I was changing tires for Danica. It was her first year. So it was 2012. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we about got cleaned. I about got cleaned out. Really? That was the closest I've ever been to like really getting hurt. Wow. Yeah. I was like, I'm, I think I'm good on changing modified tires. Oh my God. Uh, now with the cars, they're different. The, the wheels are different from what they used to be from uh, the Xfinity cars and the cup cars a couple of years ago. Now they're an aluminum alloy single yeah. lug uh they have a different profile to them what are the differences between changing those tires to the the new ones that are on the new style cars so when we started we won the first ever lug one lug nut race the daytona 500 in 2022 um we went there and truly and honestly we had done five nuts for i don't know it started they started doing pit stop they started doing the pit stop competition in 1967 mm-hmm. right so from the Wood Brothers, and then, then till in 2021, right? We were still finding new things with five lug nuts that would go wrong. Mm-hmm. And then that's over in 2021. We raced Phoenix, and then we had like 10 weeks with everything to go to Daytona 500, like figure it out. And uh, thankfully, we have a really good IndyCar program at Penske. So I got with our IndyCar coach, Sean Reineman, and we worked, we worked our butts off that off season. But we all had no idea what we were doing when we went to the Daytona 500 with one lug nut. Like, we were all very green. Did you think it was going to be easier because you only have one nut? Um, 
at first Mm -hmm. it's but what what's you it's harder now i will say that like not even being cliche right like i've changed tires in the final four like at the highest level you can possibly do it i've made the final four at phoenix with a cup car in 2020 and i made a final four at phoenix with a cup car in 2023 Mm -hmm. and pitted for a cup championship that's there's no higher level of changing tires in North American motorsports. Um, and you can get in a groove with five nuts, right? You can miss nuts. There's you, but you can get in a groove and you can be solid. You have to haul ass all the time, changing one lug nut. You are going so fast. What, what, what we've made, uh, what we've lost in consistency and being, being able to, kind of just run, you know, 12 second stops and being smooth. You can't do that anymore. You have to be smooth. You have to be consistent, but you have to do it. And not now it's nine flat, right? right? If it, a great stop is an eight second stop now God. where last year, a great stop was a nine, seven, right? Like it's, right. it's kind it's every year. It's just creeping faster and faster. And it's more of like a physical event. Like it's, you're just these athletes, you know, like Jackman or my, my Jackman Jordan is 300 pounds. He runs faster than I do. Right. And it's just like, yeah. And what, if you think you're doing good, wait three weeks because you're back behind. So like we did good. We won some races in 2020, won the all-star race, won the Daytona 500 with Austin in 2022. We got switched to Blaney halfway through the year where they kind of did his pit crew scramble. Mm. Um, won the all-star race with Blaney. We had a deep playoff run, ended up not making it the final four. But then that winter, Phoenix was over the next day. I was in there switching hands. So I changed tires right handed my whole life. I had to switch to left handed because really? it's faster to pull the trigger and pull. Yeah, you. it's like three tenths faster. So I, everything you've ever learned, now you have to relearn it with your left hand because it's faster. So that at that, it was like two or three years where I didn't take an off season. Now, do you have to ad- change that for road courses to go to your no, right hand? No. Like you do with the gas? Or? No, because oh, right. as it, what the difference is, um, when you hit the lug nut, you're loosening it. You're pulling the tire at the same time. Uh-huh. So that, that movement, you're pulling the tire with your right hand all the time. Cause you have to throw it. Uh-huh. The guys on the rear sometimes pull it with their left and kind of across their body, but on the front, you have no choice. Um, so yeah, just that was like, I thought that I, I thought my career was over cause it was a really rough off season. Uh-huh. And I was like, man, this, this is going to be the end of it. These young kids are waiting, but we were able to figure it out. And it was a little bit of a rough start to the season. Got a tough stop at, California it took us out of champ that out of the chance to win the race and end up getting wrecked like that those are the worst you just feel so bad about that but you're also like well yeah I have to do it here because like we're getting ready for we ended up winning the championship that year so it worked out are the tires uh, uh easier to work with as far as like throwing them and, and moving them around compared to the uh compared to the old tires because the old tires were steel wheels and these are aluminum so they're lighter mm-hmm. um but they're so much bigger because they're wider tire, the offset's different. To pull them out, like you get really bound up. So mm-hmm. it's really important, like where your your placement is to the car. If you get too close, you won't be able to get out of the fender well. I don't think that there's anything that's easier right. about one lug nut. Like, what we thought was going to be easier, we just made up with going faster. And it's amazing because like everything is everything is scrutinized because if you take a half a step where you could have taken a quarter of a step that shaves a tenth or whatever off your stop. And yeah, the, the metrics, I think we have like something like 28 metrics that we break stops down in. I think Gibbs has 200 metrics throughout a pit stop throughout a eight second, nine second period that they break down. And I talk about that with our pit coach quite a bit, right? Like racing Bowman gray lately, like this past, the last time I raced Bowman gray, I ran fifth, okay. but I, my average running position was probably nine and a half. A couple guys wrecked, made it back. And um, I was like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Like it was positioned by attrition, but the only thing that matters is where you finish, except for pit crew, right? You could win the race and be like, ah, well, you had a rough one on lap 300. So get back to practice. You know, it's like you're, you're, you're just based off of numbers and, it's it's really you won, but you still got to go back and fine tune. It's not for the weak man. It, not, and there's and I've been part of races where I didn't have a good race on pit road, and you feel bad going to victory lane. Mm-hmm. I have a picture I put it up on Twitter the other day. We won a race with Brad at Bristol, truck race, 
everybody's throwing beer and I'm drinking mine in the corner because it's such a bad day. I'm like, I'm drinking in the corner by myself. I don't deserve to celebrate yep, that kind yep. of shit. That's a, a thousand percent. <laughs> I know people that haven't gone to Victory Lane because they had a bad day. Really? Yeah, there's no worse feeling than having a shit day on pit road. Oh, I Your know, car I know. winning and you having to go there and act like you did something. Uh, I've, I've had bad days doing the media stuff on pit road, so I, I get it. Um, we're going to jump around a little bit because now we're going to talk about early beginnings the cool stuff wall yeah. stadium yeah you know um you grew up there uh, going to wall like a lot of kids grew up growing uh, go, going to the local track but um you uh you you started driving as a kid right Quarter yeah Midgets? five years old yeah my dad was a street stock my dad kind of started the racing bug for a whole family mm -hmm. uh, he was a started racing bmx in like the heyday of the 80s mm -hmm. um and it, him they they raced bmx and then Bluish junkyard back then was split. Like if you were to go there now, there's like a junkyard down the hill and then right next to it, there's one up the hill. That's where Jimmy lives. Mm -hmm. That was Osborne's. And they started racing enduro cars. My dad did, met the Osborne's and they would all get cars out of the junkyard and they'd go race enduros all over Flemington and Mahoning Valley, Evergreen. Um, they would even go like dirt tracks. They, they ran one, uh, in Philly in the Eagle stadium. Like, yeah, it was to Lincoln. What it wasn't, it's not Lincoln. It was JFK stadium. They were enduros. Yeah. They ran an enduro. Yeah. yeah like, kidding. yeah. Where they wreck and they parked the car on the track. Like those are my <laughs> earliest memories going to the track to Flemington Memorial day and labor day. They'd have a hundred car enduro Yeah, and they put soap on the track. It was really they, cool. I, I remember what they put soap on the track and then they put Jersey barriers one time across the back straightaway where you had to kind yeah. of go through like an S Tires, they'd have the big tires, but like then my dad raced streets, so that led to him racing street socks wall stadium. Okay, and that was like that. That's when I was younger. They I'm didn't going. run uh, street socks at Flemington or anything. Like he that. never went there. Have they, you ever, you ever raced at Flemington? I now no, I was too young. I drove uh, I drove three races there in a midget, and the place scared the shit out of me. Yeah. Uh, you know, in in a midget, you're flying around that place, and you're going into the blind corners because they've got walls on both sides, but. I've never been in a place that was just so fast and just wanted to pull you into the wall. The yeah. best racers. I still feel that the best racers come from there. I mean, it's what Flemington, I think we can, we can talk about like Ray being from wall stadium, but that Flemington innovation and what those guys did there with the DA modifieds and the, the tour modifieds and the late models, uh, Scott Davidson, who works on, you know, who I work with quite a bit on the midget stuff and even my modified stuff, like those guys were way ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that level of competition, I mean, that's what, that's where the rainbow warriors ended up coming from, you know, that, that type of stuff that was learned there. And Jimmy Wismer, and you look at every division there, John Blue at the third, everybody that ran, it was like a who's who. I remember going there for, the uh, race champions. We'd go camp uh, with my dad and just that. I remember the Sheba truck pulled in with uh, Steve Park driving it. And mm -hmm. I, I got out, like we were sleeping in the van. I got out in the van in the morning on the air mattress. I was like, oh, it was like, you know, seeing that was like seeing a cup team for me. Right. It was a big When deal. you're a kid. Yeah, exactly. These guys to us were gods. Yeah, I know. So, so I and being there when John won it, because I was always a big, you know, he was like the hometown guy by Wall Stadium. So mm -hmm. being there when John won it and, I remember when Bill, I was always a big Billy Pouch fan. Oh, I was there the year he won it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, that was and a surprise. Reggie's car. Well, we were Billy Pouch fans because my dad, like, we he never put a cat, he never put a lid on what we did. Right? We'd be at East Windsor on Fridays watching big blocks. We'd be at Wall Stadium Saturday if Wall Stadium was running. We'd be at Flemington Sunday. We'd go to like sometimes Bridgeport ran. We'd be everywhere. Mm -hmm. We'd be New Egypt asphalt track Wednesday nights. I, I have like a bunch of big wheel wins from there with Warren Austin. <laughs> uh, but that we were, I mean, we would go racing five nights a week just to watch. Like, and then I'd race myself on Sundays once I got old enough. So yeah, I started at five years old racing quarter midgets uh, on Sundays at Wall Stadium. That is amazing. Uh, did you do any dirt stuff when you were, when you were coming up? I mean, I yeah. know you've, I, the only dirt experience that I know of you trying was the outlaw card at Millbridge, but I so, don't know if you did any other dirt stuff. I was better at dirt when I was a kid. Um, we would go on Wednesday nights when I got a little older, we'd race with the same, we would take the same quarter midget and you just raise it up mm -hmm. put a couple rounds in it, maybe change the spring. And we would go to Phoenixville, um, which is in Pennsylvania. 
And like we would race against like Lance DeWeese's kid, or, or not Lance DeWeese, um, Freddie Raymer's kid okay. was there. And there's a lot of like still wagons. Like when you look back at those pictures, it's a lot of the same kids that still race. Mm-hmm. Little Billy Pouch would race. He was a year younger than me or so. But yeah, that was my favorite track. And we would run ADCO uh, down in South Jersey. Um, we'd travel around running some dirt. We'd race with the same car, dirt and asphalt. And then when I got a little older, we just we just stuck to asphalt stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always wanted to race dirt. And I did a little bit with the dirt modified that we built with Strickler up here. Right. But growing up, it was mainly asphalt stuff. Yeah, and uh, that is a lot of the stuff that I grew up on too. But, you know, you brought up a really good point about – all those guys coming from like the Flemington and, and Wall Stadium area that are I- I- excelling down here, down south, is that it, Flemington, it was for, if you're a short track racer, Flemington was like a weekly super speedway race. So yeah. you had to learn like aero and all of that kind of stuff. And then Wall, being that it was just super speedway high banked, you had to figure out setups for high bank tracks and, and that kind of stuff, which I think was great training ground for guys like you and all the ones that came down and moved down south. Throw into that that I rock got put there right in the middle of all of it, right? Yeah. So those guys were all learning how to professionally build race cars as well. Mm-hmm. So then that trickled over to the short tracks. So, you know, that I remember when I rock shut down, it slowly started and it's taken years, but it slowly started to degrade the level of competition and how nice, like, dude, you went there, everybody's cars were beautiful. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's slowly gotten away from that. Um, and a high tide raises all ships. Right. So you have a couple guys do it and then everybody does it. It's become, it's what becomes normal. But yeah, I mean like the, the more that I race down here and the more that I start to learn, like I kick, kick myself cause I'm 36 now. And I like, I wish I knew when I was younger, but the keys to knowing about all this stuff, they're there. You got to go talk to the Lenny Boyds, mm-hmm. to the Scott Davidsons, like the, the, the guys that, that did it. Ray, right. Ray will open up about it too. Right. Um, they have yeah, the wisdom. Clyde McLeod. They have the experience. Yeah. Right. Clyde McLeod, who was on here, was my boss at Stuart Haas. <laughs> right. And like, I love, we had so much fun together and it was sad to leave when I left there. But he said, hey, when I retire, I'm coming to Atlantic City. And this past year, we're in the Gambler's Classic and who comes walking in the trailer? Clyde McLeod. Yeah. I told you I'd come. And he was, we had so much fun, but like the amount of racing and stuff that they've done, if you just ask them, right. They, the racing's a circle, man. The same issues come up like every 10 years Mm -hmm. and they've, they've all done it. And it's, it's really, and the same, you know, it's just metal going around in a circle. Right. Right. They've all done it and figured it out with less rules and with less, like back then you couldn't just go to, motor state and buy whatever you needed right you had to build it you had to go to the junkyard and get it right they've done it the hard way easier now right because now you you can build a race car out of a catalog yeah or just buy it do you think though with the younger generation of race car drivers now coming in to that uh, a lot of that is going away because we don't have these kids working on their stuff like they used to they just show up and drive i don't like i don't know i just think that they I don't think about it that much because I'm still like an active, I'm still a little close to the fire to like try to fix all the problems in the sport. Mm. Um, but I, yeah, it's just, we're smarter too. Like there's shit that we did back in the nineties and early two thousands that if we were doing it today, we'd be like, what are we doing? <laughs> right. We've just evolved as humans to be smarter <laughs> and not spend that much time. Right. You know? And, uh, and yeah, it's just, it's just different. But you go to like you go to Bowman Gray and it's as healthy as it's ever been. Right. Uh-huh. Like I like so it's it it comes down to the level of the competition around you, the level of people around you. Like there's a kid, Chase Robertson, that races at Bowman Gray, and he's badass, dude. Mm-hmm. And he's young. He's like 18 years old. Mm-hmm. His cars are nice, right? Freaking wins the races. Like there's it's it's really so like I, I have a hard time judging it but you know there's just the problem is it's just so accelerated because it's so much easier for a kid with you know a couple hundred thousand dollars to just go buy a venture in or ride and not go race late models or anything you know like that's that's it's if you're a dad mm-hmm. and you're a good businessman um it the, the business model doesn't make sense to go buy your own stuff buy a trailer go late model race and pay the people Right. Or just, go, you know, and you go to just an go established team, write a check to, you know, whatever team and go race. 
Mm-hmm. It's a way better business model for a, a smart businessman that owns, you know, has some money. It's unfortunate though, because I get it that teams need to stay in business to keep the lights on and, and all of that. But, and we've talked to Bill Venturini about this. It, it's tough because now nobody's getting a ride on their ability anymore. They're, you know, they're getting a ride on what they can bring to the table. Yeah. But you know, that's why when someone like Kyle Larson shows up, you know, some, a lot of guys are in trouble and that'll get you so far, right? Instagram likes can only get you so far. Right. Right. And then you got to, then you got to get in the car right? and you, you, you can only make it to a certain level and, and there's one or two bad mofos there that make you look dumb. Right. <laughs> and, and there's, don't get me wrong. It's, it's frustrating for anybody, especially me. I, I didn't grow up with anything. Mm-hmm. Had literally nothing <laughs> moved here with nothing. And, um, it's, it's easy to get frustrated at some of the kids that had more opportunities, but some of them are damn good too. Right. So you just, you know, you, and then there are some that'll never get an opportunity, which I mean, it, you go to any short track on a Saturday night, like you said, the, the, the Robertson kid, you know, super duper talented. Um, but, some he may not get to the top level just because of the funding and the money and, and all of that. Yeah, and some people don't want to. Like, mm-hmm. I think everybody, like, I saw that with John the third when I worked at the junkyard there. Mm-hmm. Like, I thought he was good enough. I thought he had some opportunity. and He had funding. Mm-hmm. But he wanted to race modifieds and run the junkyard. You know, and that's okay. You know, it's like, that's that's okay for some people. Right. That, you know, if I... I like for me, right. I don't go race. I'm not driving for the hillbillies cause I want to go drive for Roger one day. Mm-hmm. Roger Penske. Like I, I just want to go race. I want to go to the racetrack with good people mm-hmm. and I want to work on my race car, make it faster. I want to figure out a way to win a race. And then when I win a, win a race, I want to drink a beer and drive home. And then <laughs> I want to come back and do it again next week. Like That's why I go race. I'm not doing it. Like I'm not doing it for like Instagram likes, even though that that's like a, you, you have to do that to keep up with sponsors. Oh, nowadays, and, you know, yeah. you, it's, it's part of the game and it's cool. It's cool that you document it. Dude, how many races did you win when you were a kid or stuff that you did that you wish you had Instagram to yeah. be able to show people? Mm-hmm. My right? first go-kart it's, win. I don't have any proof or pictures or anything. All I've got is a trophy. It's a history book. Yeah. You, roll, you scroll back through it and it's a history book, dude. Yeah. So as, as much of a, I mean, it is what you make it. Mm-hmm. That's like, that's, I think that's been the biggest thing I've learned after having kids and all that stuff. Like everything just is what you make it, especially mm-hmm. racing, right? Every, and everybody digests racing different, right? I know. Like everybody, like there's guys that are super passionate, like Matt Dillner, right? He's super passionate. He needs it this way. This is wrong, you know? <laughs> and then like, I'm like on the other side where like, I understand where he's coming from. I do, but like, I don't know. I just want to go race. Like I can't change the promoter, what they're doing or change the rule. I'm just going to okay, this is the mousetrap I have. How do I make it faster than the next guy? That's what I'm into Okay. right now. Right. Well, all the mousetraps that you own seem to go pretty fast because <laughs> the TQ, you kick ass in the TQs. You won in the midget uh, as well. And that one was really surprising when I saw that you won in the midget. Why are you because, surprised by that? Because it's, it's well, first off, the rumble in the dome is, is big. I mean, yeah. Tony Stewart has been trying to win the race for a long time. I mean, Ligori just won it after, I think, 12 or 13 years yeah. of, of trying it. And I uh, got his Gavada Kuzi zero time rumble champion. I'm glad I got it on Friday. Uh, from Ligori? Ligori. He's yeah. a great guy. That's he been is. the best part of that deal. So, now, do you own that midget? No, it's Lusconi owns that. Okay. So, and that is one How of cool the, is that? Right. I know. Right. Like, that's why like, I'm like, pinch myself. Like if, if you would have told me I've done all this, you know, like 20 years ago, mm-hmm. if they were like, Hey, what do you want to be in 20 years? I'd be like, what the, the guy I am right now? Like the probably less, you know, like they're very lucky to do that. But like, it's so funny because, and you know it. You just move the goalpost because now you're pissed off where you are. Now you should be further. Right. You're like, wait a minute. I got to have some, like, that's one thing that I worked on last year, standing on the wall to win a cup championship. Right. Like everything I've ever did. When you go back to, I found my wrestling program from my senior night, high school, Manasquan high school wrestling. Everybody's like, uh, when this guy graduates, he's going to Rutgers. When this guy graduates, he's going to Monmouth. When this guy graduates, going to West Virginia. Ryan Flores, when he graduates, he's going to move to North Carolina and pursue being on a pit crew. That's what it said. Like, that was my plan. Right. Right. And like, I'm standing on the wall last year, the talk Kosh comes out with 30 to go in Phoenix. And I'm like, fuck yeah. 
this is why I started. Right. There was no like, oh, I hope I don't mess this up. Like, this is, give me the ball. This is why I started. Mm-hmm. This is exactly where you want to be. Let's go. And it was, and that got every bit of worry. Like that gratitude just got rid of every bit of worry in my body. So when you hit all of those goals, then what's next for you? Just keep racing. You just, yeah. Right? I like just keep racing and, and, and learn to enjoy it. Like, I, man, I have so many friends that race short track stuff that just worry about getting to the next race. Yeah. Like whatever it takes, burn the bridge, get to the next race. I don't care. Like, and I love my, some of my friends that do that to death, but that's like not the, I want to go like, I want to go with, dude, how cool is that? That like, I get to drive this, the Hillbilly 79. Like that's a pretty iconic car, dude. Yeah. Right. I get to go like, that's pretty cool for me. And then, like David and Derek are like, yeah, that's pretty cool for us too. You know, we got Ryan Blaine's tire changer here and we're working together and we're making it better. And we run top five last time we were at the stadium. We're going to win one of them damn races. So don't, <laughs> don't be surprised. It's when not going to surprise there. me because uh, you, you've got to, I, I will give it to you. You've got a knack for winning on tight, confined spaces because the, between the indoor midget wins, Bowman Gray, and then of course, being the uh, the one of the favorite sons of the field fillers fairgrounds, yeah, you know, yeah, that, but, and I and you know what the field fillers in my opinion taught you how to do the indoor shit. I tell everybody that. They're like, <laughs> where did you come from? I said, field filler fairgrounds. But when I first got my first race, I ran second to Andy J. Yeah, and I fin- Teddy, I passed Teddy. He finished third. Yeah, and I remember he's like, "Where the hell did you come from, kid?" And uh, I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> good old Teddy." He, it was funny. Um, he had passed, I got tight late in that race and he had passed me. He passed me pretty clean. Mm-hmm. Like we were going back, I got him on a restart and then he car, I got tight one time and he carved me up and after the race, and then there was a late restart. I got back by him, run second. I didn't know what I was doing. If I knew what I was doing, Andy J would have one less win. Cause I would have tuned my, <laughs> I know how to tune my car and from the cockpit. Now I was just hanging on for dear life. Um, but after the race, he goes, uh, I never, I didn't like Teddy because I was John blew a guy mm-hmm. and they didn't like each other, but I didn't know him. Never, never knew him. I moved when I was 19. I was a quiet kid. You know, I was around Jimmy quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, like did a lot of racing with Jimmy, but Jimmy was pretty brash, uh, and rubbed a lot of people <laughs> the wrong way that I left even before his, uh, like we, I still just did the wall stadium stuff with him, did his first couple of tour starts, but it was even before the Eddie Partridge days or he started doing any of that. Um, and, Teddy goes, I freaking carved your eyeballs out, kid. That's the first thing he ever said to me. And I said, yeah, where'd you end up? Oh, fuck you. <laughs> that's what he said. That's Teddy. <laughs> and, uh, and that's exactly what he said. He said, ah, you're all right. Because Joe Pelham, thank God, was there. And Joe Pelham, you know, oh, yeah. growing up at the Joy, like, I don't say, I wouldn't say I grew up at the Joy seating. I grew from a, a young man to an adult at the right. Joy seating, though. And Pelham was there. And we would always bust each other's balls about, you know, uh, about oh, Joe loved Teddy, Teddy. Oh, yeah. And I was a John guy and, uh, you know, it was fun. But when I, I really got a pretty good relation, I really had a pretty good relationship with Teddy through the indoor stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, later on, he would, he would say like, you should let me drive that 15 car. I can win in it. I'm like, well, what are you <laughs> saying? I can't, well, no, nah, well, that's not what I mean. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I ran second to him in his last ever indoor win. Did you really? It was a Friday night in Atlantic City. Yeah. Oh, God. Teddy was something. I, I ran with him a few times in the midgets, and uh, one of my most memorable times racing with Teddy Christopher was uh, at Thompson in the World Series. And again, my father, the way he is, he knew who I was starting around guys with a lot of wisdom. He leans in and he says, you know, Teddy, start next to you. Follow him and see if you, what you can learn. Okay, Dad. No problem. Rolling down back straight away at pace laps. I look over at Teddy, give him a wave, you know, good luck. He gives me the one finger salute out to the left <laughs> side of the cage. We get to three and four and he must, he knew it. He knew what he was doing. He put his left side nerf bar right to my right front. And as soon as we got the green, he just yeah. hooked left and shoved me down onto the apron and he took off and he was gone. And I said, I'm going to have to bring a lot more to the table if I'm going to compete with Teddy. My big, Yeah. Dude, he was, he was real deal. My biggest compliment, we were racing at Allentown and he said he was having a hard time on restarts. And I was, and he said, how the, how the hell are you doing that? Like he asked me, how are you doing? What are you doing? And I knew like there was a patch of rubber that I was getting that no one else was getting to. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't know, man. Car must be good. Like, I just played dumb. But the best one. Hey, you never show them the map. No, the best. Well, I was like, damn, Teddy Christopher just asked me what I was doing. I'm right. doing pretty good. <laughs> uh, I was like, damn, this is, this is progressing pretty quickly. Because um, I never got opportunities, man. Like, I was the plumber's kid. My dad never had money. And mm-hmm. he kind of always was battling, like, addiction and stuff. So that's how I ended up at Blewett's. Mm-hmm. Um, because there was, like, bad, like, broken home. Mm-hmm. And I ended up just going to Blewett's Junkyard. But. The funny Teddy story back to Blewitz was when uh, I had the first time I passed Jimmy ever in the midget. I, I got to him. He got tight. And it was at Allentown that first year. And Teddy and Jimmy never, they get they got along, but they always raced pretty hard against each other. And uh, I got by Jimmy and he like stuffed me in the tires, stuffed me in the tires again. Then I got by him and he hit me in the bumper and like almost like tried to spin me out the next corner. And I just like gathered up and kept going. And we had to stop on the front stretch. And Teddy was the first, Teddy had blown up. He was the first one to my car because I finished second to Eric. And they make top three stop at the front stretch. And he come around and he's, that's your fucking buddy. That's your fucking buddy. Now you know. Now you know what we all deal with. And I just looked at him and I said, that's the difference between me and you, Ted. And he's like, what's that? I said, I know he's going to race hard. Yeah. I, I just pulled my belts tight and knew what I was in for. Right. You guys complain about it. Like he's, pretty consistently a hard racer Mm -hmm. right especially when his car is not really good he's pissed off because he's been working on it Mm -hmm. and he's gonna be he's gonna be pretty rough i said so that's i said i think that might be a little bit of a difference but you know to to jimmy's credit he was a little bit better than me the gambler's classic i run i won and he had a shot to to move me out of the way and spin me and he didn't so is that where you get the the white car thing from 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 jimmy because you know jimmy's got jimmy's cars are so clean you can eat off of them my dad oh yeah my dad my dad had white cars and then when i was so Joey Payne, the, everybody you had on your show is like part of my racing story. So I know I'm doing something, <laughs> but I admit and I they'll, raced, they'll listen to the show and watch well, it. Well, so. I had raced legend cars and done pretty well. I swept Turkey Derby. Mm-hmm. Um, there was 40 cars there. Beat some really good guys. We swept Turkey Derby. And those damn things are hard to drive too. Wall Stadium, man. They were, they were tough. I used, I got borrowed tires from the Bassets. Like I got, <laughs> it's not the, the last time I ever got borrowed, but I got tires from the back. Like I didn't have any money. I scrapped this thing together. Uh, I was a car from that I built like junk. It was an old Jordan Anderson chassis mm-hmm. with a is a yellow body, RS center body. It was like I've got a bought a motor from. It was like uh, a neon yellow, wasn't it? Yeah, because RS center. Okay. If you go back and remember him from Georgia, mm-hmm. if you if you go back and look at his car, he his car that was if you got up to close to it, the neon was faded from where the decals were. I just took everything that was junk. And built this car and just got a, they had like spec motors that had just come out and I guess it just got a good one. Right. But yeah, we went to Turkey Derby and won um, the first night and then came back and won the second night, swept it. So I got the wreath and everything. Um, and then we won a good amount of races with that car. Uh, but through all that, I knew Joey Payne. His kids raced quarter midgets. My dad would go to the corner of the track with John Blue at the fourth, would help them out. And uh, Joey was like, man, I got Timex Morgan owned. Laffler cars. Mark Laffler worked for Timex. Mm-hmm. And that's when I drove the first car. They had an extra car and then I got in it for Atlantic City. They kind of just like, yeah, if you think you can race it, go ahead. So your and first race was in a TQ, at, in a TQ was at Wall. Was that Gambler's Class? Was that the game? Oh, it was in First ever one. Okay. Yeah. So uh, everybody said the same thing. And you had already I was surprised had laps. you did so good. Yeah. Well, so why is everybody so surprised? What did I suck or something? <laughs> but it was just like, I got in it and the, the, I, Doug E2, was one of Mark Laffler's uh, guys. He was my crew chief. Mm-hmm. And I remember after the second practice, he goes, Oh, we got, we got a shot here. Yeah. You're not, you're not, you're not half bad. It's field fair fairgrounds. I went out first practice, felt it out. And I'm like, Oh, this is just the field fair fairgrounds. Straight lines, right? Turn straight lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, qualified ninth. Um, first time, the hundred, that was still hundred cars. Mm-hmm. Got banged around in my heat race. Um, and then got banged around. Akansi missed the show by one spot. And then I was the alternate, but Hoddick, Trey Hoddick had qualified, Al qualified me by one spot. He got banged around too, so he got the fast time. I missed the show by one spot. <sighs> um, so it was just like I met that, met Mark Laffler, and Joey got me that ride. Mm-hmm. Um, Joey's and then good people. Joey's great. Uh, dude, people don't <laughs> understand how hard he wrecked with Stafford. <laughs> when he like in, when, in Gene's car well it, yeah. yeah but when he gets like mad right that people don't understand how like I think 
like he hit his freaking head a ton, dude. He was he's lucky to be alive. I know. And Bent the seat he got before. a little bit more edgy after that though. Mm. Um he, but Joey, dude, thank God for for Joey starting that deal. And then Mark Laffler was building cars and I took all my tire change of money that I was making from Arca and trucks and Xfinity because I was getting paid cash, mm -hmm. put it aside. And uh our, um my dad's girlfriend at the time, Jane, helped our racing career out and we kind of split that car and we ended up with that car. And the first year I was gonna go run it, but I broke my freaking wrist at turkey derby in an evans car racing uh, a sportsman the sport and i didn't mod, get to right? race it so i just watched and took notes and the next year when i came and showed up with that thing i mean i had been working i mean in my little I mean, two, me and two tall lived in a townhouse in davidson and i had that thing shoved in the little garage in the back and i just <laughs> go out there and cut and move this and move that and when we showed up the first time i finally brought it over to seat shop at LaJoy's and worked on it and it was fast right out of the box and I was like man we're Corey came to Trenton with me and we worked on that thing Jimmy had kind of a baseline setup then we worked on it worked on it worked on it and qualified dead last I ripped the left front off and qualifying and yeah we ended up running second and we've been on a tear with that thing ever since 10 years now the TQ has been uh, pretty cool for you that guys. Thing, that, thing, that thing's made its money for sure that's been a good investment so you've you've driven the TQ <clears throat> You've driven the midget, the modified, street stock, dirt modified. Um, what do you want to run next? I just want to run modifieds. Like that's I've always just wanted to race tour modifieds. That's okay. that was my goal. Um what about a super, super modified? I I would love if to. If you can dude, if you can drive a TQ, you can drive a super modified. So let's talk to Lou quite a bit about it. And mm -hmm. my buddy Chris Doritas, mm -hmm. uh he had a couple, but I don't think that that's something you dabble in. Like, you got to be pretty all in. Timmy J, I've talked to Tim. Like, that's the best part. Like, going to the Rumble, man. I get all, I'm getting all over the place here, but like, I meet a lot of super modified guys when I go out to the Rumble for the guys from Ohio. And then, same thing indoors. Um, yeah, I would love, I would love to, but it, it would have to be like if Bobby Timmons had a spare car and I could just show up at Star with my helmet bag, right? <laughs> Something like that. Um, Those things are badass. Doc, man. Doc, who was, he works with Clyde Booth quite a bit. He he worked on our car at the Rumble the first year I went. He's like, go see Clyde. Go see Clyde in Mooresville. Just go say hey. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I got kids and shit. <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I can't. But uh, I would. I mean, the there's nothing cooler. Awesome. I remember watching them at Flemington when I was a kid and I had to throw the caution because the light poles were swaying so bad. Yeah. Talk about going fast. But yeah, that was, I, I don't know. As far as your question, though, like I, I, I'd be good sticking with tour modifieds for a little while and, and just having fun and enjoying it. I'm really enjoying Saturdays right now, Bowman Gray. That brings me to this question is how did the whole deal come together with driving for the hillbillies? James Savali. So James is, I've raced with James since we were, <coughs> I've raced with James since we were kids, um, core midget racing. And I didn't really know him back then, but, and I watched him like the first time I ever saw James, race a big car. He moved Teddy out of the way at the ice at the maybe it wasn't the ice break, the World Series at Thompson. Right. Um I was like, damn, this kid's badass. And just kind of watched his whole career. But he ended up working for Joey. So I ran a I ran a building from Joey um for the powder coat shop from Logano. Mm -hmm. And James was his property manager more or less. Kind of worked on all Joey's cars and just really had a good relationship with James. And still just consider him a really good friend. And I'm building my own PSR car right now. And oh, I, yeah, just, I know what, what, <laughs> I, that, I, didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want to say anything, but yeah, yeah, I was at PSR the other day and I saw white frames sitting it's hard on the uh, Yeah. It's hard to stand. tell. Everything's white. <laughs> Everything's yeah. white. Um, but I, I just, with my guys, I have such a good group of guys that come indoor racing. Uh, Danny LaFerrier, who's the crew chief on the four car back in the day, crew chief, Justin before stone did mm -hmm. Scott Davidson. Obviously he's, I, a lot of people don't know who Scott is, but Scott, um, Scott started racing with his best friend, his best friend in fourth grade that lived across the street, brought him to the racetrack. His best friend was Ray Abraham. Oh, right? okay. So Scott's been around forever. Um, mm -hmm. he's, he crew chiefs those drift cars. He crew chiefs Blake Barney on the smart tour. Okay. Uh, he's, he's really, really good. Everything he touches goes fast. Um, and then Freddie Harbeck's grandson, Jeff Harbeck. Oh, comes yeah, with I know me. Jeff. Like, Jeff my my uncle Jeff, right? My, my cousins come. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's I have such a good team indoors. I'm like, man, we got to go compete other places. I don't want to run thirty races a year. I want to run five. Mm -hmm. So I kind of circled the um, 
the first one I had circled was the Hayes Jewelers 200. I remember sitting there on an off weekend, pissed off that I wasn't racing a Bowman Gray, watching the Hayes Jewelers 200, like in the last five, six years, right? Like, man, it's an off week. I could be there right now. It might have been like Easter weekend. It might have fallen on. So it's like, I've always wanted to run that race. So we were going to build my car to go there, and it just wasn't on schedule. Your I PSR car. I wasn't going to make it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't have the time to do it. And it started getting closer, and I talked to James Savali just on the phone bullshit, and I said, you running Bowman Gray? He's like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not running. It's like, you mind if I call David? He's like, call him. I said, I'm not calling him unless it's okay with you. Like, I don't want you to get pissed off that I still your ride, so I'm going to text you in the morning. Mm-hmm. And if you send me David Hill's number, I'm going to call him. And he sent me David Hill's number in the morning. And uh, he, uh, D- D- David and I talked a couple weeks, and he's like, yeah, let's do it. I showed up with my guys were coming anyway. So the Hillbillies didn't have any, any driver lined up for the upcoming season? No. Okay. No, they didn't have anybody because James wasn't going to do it. And uh, Zach Brewer, unfortunately, passed away. Right. And um, Bellows doing just the smart tour yeah, stuff. Yeah, I think there's them. too many conflicts with mm-hmm. Stafford and stuff. Right. Um, So they were like, yeah, let's go. And that first, you know, my Uncle Jeff drove, Rome, like all my cousins worked on Rome Penix cars. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so he drove the truck. And he was buddies with their truck driver, so they always hung out. So it was like kind of a, a reunion, and okay. it was so much fun, man. I had like those guys are re- they. I went up to their shop, and it's it's easy to forget, but they have won a lot of races with a lot of really good people. And when you look at the victory lane pictures, it's it's a who's who of people that have, they've come come through the sport with and they've worked with and. Uh, Daniel Hemrick, Eddie Flemke, uh, Woody Pickett, Woody Pickett Ronnie Pickett, Sill, James Savali, Teddy. Like, yeah. And then you look at the pictures, Ryan Stone's working on the thing. Like it's, it's a lot of great guys. Mm-hmm. Corey won a race with them in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, I remember it was know, his first modified win too. Yeah. So I was like, I called David and he's like, yeah, let's do it. I was like, okay. Hell yeah. I have no idea. Like, dude, granted the, the, the only guy who's ever given me a shot and they're modified, they're, they're tour modified other than Jimmy let me run his wall mod once. Um, and then uh, was Mike Davini who just unfortunately passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike let me run Turkey Derby in a Spafco car. And we had a blast, man. We had to run the LCQ. We got there. We were okay. We worked on the car. I didn't, I didn't know Wall Stadium was so small. Right? I've never went around there. I've went around there a lot of times. <laughs> The straightaways get significantly shorter with 650 horsepower. Um, I about wrecked the thing first lap. I whistled it down in the three and it didn't. Oh, it was bad. Thank God I grew up going there because I would have planted it in the pit gate if I didn't know what I was doing. But Wall is a super fast track, too, for being a short track. I mean, it's 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 a miniature Bristol, really. Dude, it's That's why guys that come out of there are so good. Yeah. Um, a lot of them. But it also kind of, it also can make you a little bit of like a, can make you struggle at flat tracks a little bit. But. I, I can understand that because you just want you can you can drive the shit out of your car wall stadium <laughs> and in other places you can't do that yeah um but like that's why i that's why jimmy's so good i mean i put jimmy blew it just seat sitting in the seat talent wise mm-hmm. when his head's on right he's better than anybody right you know just he's got because he's got that next like that wall stadium next gear right that it just takes to just it's so narrow it's so fast got to figure out how to pass. You got to be a little rough. Sometimes you got to be a lot rough, right? Mm-hmm. And But sometimes you also have to be crafty. You got to be able to run the top. You got to be able to run the bottom. You got to be able to bounce off the fence. You got to be able to drive through the infield. Like there's Similar so much. things that you have to do at Bowman Gray in a way. If you think Bowman Gray is just way slower. <laughs> yeah. Bowman Gray is just way slower. Um, yeah. So, but my point to there is I've never run a full tour race because we blew up early at Wall. We made the, we made the show through the LCQ. Mm-hmm. Um, and I that was my first ever tour modified race and we only made it like 10 laps and we broke a motor. So I had never run a modified tour race in my life. So the Hayes Drillers 200 is going to be the first one. Oh, no kidding. And, uh, we just got better. All we broke, we got there on Friday for practice. Second run of practice, we broke a motor yeah. and I'm like, maybe it's just, I called my wife. I said, maybe I'm just not like, maybe God just doesn't want me to race modifieds. <laughs> maybe it's just not meant for me. I don't know. And then David's like, yeah, no, we're getting a motor. We're going to put it in and we're going to go race. We just worked all day and put the motor in it. Next day went out and qualified well mm. and raced, you know, right there around the backside of the top 10. Um, and 
kept in one piece and finished sixth. So before this year uh, started, you had never turned a lap at Bowman Gray. In I ran one uh, stadium stock race there last year. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, for Patrick Mullen. We had a blast. That's why like, <laughs> I went there and I commentated those, those with Those four Dillner. cylinders, the races look fun. They're so much fun. Are they? But it's like, it's like my two things encompassed in the one, indoor racing and street stock racing. Because it's like a mini street stock. And the track's like a big indoor car. So it's like a, it's like an indoor street stock race. And it's almost a combination of, yes. the, of the two. We won the race. There was something that happened in tech where they, they didn't let us keep the win, but we ended up winning the race. No First time I went around there, but it was because I went there to commentate with Dillner. And I'm mm -hmm. like, man, I'd love to go around this place. And Patrick Mullen, another wall stadium guy. He's like, I got, let's go, dude. And we had, we just had so much fun. Like I went there for morning practice and my wife came up with the kids and we, Hung out in Winston for the day. There's a lot to do. There's a cool playground with like dinosaurs and stuff that we went to and just made it a fun day. And it was a blast. Now, when these guys call you to to drive their car here and there, it, are they asking you to bring anything to the deal or are they telling you to cover the crash? Most clause, of the time, or it's no. just like, here, come drive my stuff and have fun. Yeah. Like, I mean, most of the time, not like just tires or whatever it takes. You mm -hmm. know, every, every situation is a little bit different. Okay. Um, But like, I don't have funding to, bring a bunch of money. Right. It's not really an option. So like, if you're calling me to drive, I don't have it. Right. I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, I can maybe get tired sometimes and I'll do whatever I can for your sponsors and try to help out. But like, right. Which is, pay. which nowadays is the old school way to do it. You, you know, it's getting, getting opportunities because you can drive the shit out of something. Dude, but Bowman, going to Bowman Gray is like going back in time. Right. Like, like you get, there's sponsors there. There's people that are invested into it. It's, I can only imagine that that's what like Riverside Park was like back in the day, right? Like, oh, there Bowman was no Gray place is, like Riverside dude, Park. Bowman Gray is healthy, and I've been to over a hundred racetracks, mm -hmm. and I keep my ear to the ground on short track, even though I'm cup racing every week. I and Flow has made it very accessible, but yeah. like I went up and raced at Stafford two years ago. I, I would fly there and race on Friday nights. I've been to Irwindale and everywhere in between, and. They've got a special sauce there where they're invested in the community. I mean, Stafford does too. Stafford's no joke. The roots are badass. Dude. Yeah. And, and But you can tell when you go to the racetrack, like, ooh, these guys are doing it. Bowman Gray is one of the very few weekly racetracks that has that almost like a, a, a cup energy vibe to it because after the race, you know, you've got these regular local guys that work 40-hour-a-week jobs that have got – a line of people a hundred long that want their autograph. Like, you, you know, you can go there and be a superhero one night a week. Is that Dave Moody that said that on here? Like these are, these guys from, from Monday to Friday or. Well, Dave Moody said, uh, he says that guy that just won his heat race, he said he may be picking up your garbage tomorrow, yeah. but tonight he's a hero. Yeah. And that's yeah. what Bowman Gray is mm -hmm. for sure. And it's just so, it's just so refreshing have you gotten the long autograph line yet? For uh, no, I've had a help? couple. I've had signed a couple, but I, I, you know, the the problem like this week, I was done and I was out before the next feature because I had to go to uh, Darlington the next day. Okay. So like I'm not, I I'm not like I just got to get out of there and get home and get to bed for the next for for Sunday because I got to be right for Sunday. That was that was my actually my next question. Like, how do you? How, is the team cool with you racing on a Saturday when you know you got to be over the wall the next day on Sunday? If it starts affecting my performance, they don't be cool with it. Right. But, you know, I pick races that, like, I, I made sure that the first race I did was before Talladega, where I knew that it wasn't going to be a huge pit stop race. Mm -hmm. And that's what I told David after the race. I said, I'm going to see how, you, how I feel tomorrow. After 200 laps, we'll see how I feel tomorrow. If I feel good and I feel like I could perform, then we'll do this. If I if it's going to, like, affect my performance on Sunday, I'm, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that's, that's, I felt great this okay. week too. I went to Darlington and had a great day. Okay. It helps me because. How? That, How does it help you? Because I'm just, because I'm a racer. So I have to be racing. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, I am, my, my wife says it, she says it fills your cup when you're racing. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm like a cage dog if I'm sitting in my backyard watching flow. I know. Right. I'm like, oh, I want to get, I got to be there. I got to Like I am. My best self when I'm competing with a race car with a group of guys, that's when I'm the best. Mm -hmm. That's when I'm the, that's when I'm not pissed off. That's when I'm not, I don't have a chip on my shoulder that like, that's, that's when I'm the happiest. That's when I could, and then that's when I can be the best husband, 
and the best teammate for my guys on Sunday and the sharpest, like I'm tapped in and I, like, I have to do that. Right. That's some guys like go drink Miller lights or sit at the bar. I don't, I just like racing and I like being around racers and good people. And that's all I've ever wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, you know, for the Hills to give me that opportunity is just like awesome. And, and I've really just fallen like Bowman gray. The racing's pretty good. Mm-hmm. What I've learned is that a lot of the wrecks are just because it's tight. Your nerf bars don't line up. You get up and over each other. There's some guys that have like, you know, whatever, a little bit rougher than others, but you just run out of room real quick. But like the theatrics of it, one, I think a lot of them know what they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. To sell t-shirts. But two, like I said it on Stack and Pennies, there's like generational hatred. Like the, oh, a yeah. lot of them, their dads race against each other, their grandfather race against each other, or yeah. they've been racing against each other for 30 years. So it takes a shove. And the drama is real. Like oh, they, yeah. like it's Hatfields versus McCoys. Some yeah. families, there are some families there that just despise each other. Yeah. Because, but, but they also like, they despise each other, but they also like, if they saw each other broke down the side of the road, probably help each other out. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, that's the nice part about is about racing is we're all the same. Mm-hmm. Right. We, yeah. We compete against each other, but how many people have as deep of a love for racing like you and I do? Right. It's not many. Mm-hmm. especially short track stuff. So at the end of the day, right, we're pissed off at each other on Sunday or on Saturday night or when we're competing, but we're all the damn same. Mm-hmm. That's why we hate each other so much. Cause we're all exactly the same, I guess. But when you get, when you separate it, like that's where I've really tried to separate friendship and racing. And like Teddy did it really well. Like, yeah, we'll smash, but then we'll be cool. Like separate it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think working at the highest level of the sport, like I have for damn near 20 years has really helped me to separate that because I, I, on Sundays, you got to deal with the noise, right? If you have a bad day, you got to deal with the, the corporate stuff on Monday or getting fired or getting taken off a car. I've been through all that. Mm-hmm. Right. So when because I guess if go, you make a mistake on pit road, you know, you get your walking papers on well, Monday morning. It's not that bad. Know. Like it's not that you have to make quite a bit of mistakes to get your walking papers, yeah. but it's even worse than that. When you make a couple of mistakes on pit road, you lose confidence and then you got to work through it. Mm-hmm. Right. Getting fired is one thing, but digging yourself out of a hole, dude, that's real deal stuff. And yeah. you got it like to be a pro that's peaks and valleys. You go through all the time. Right. And you got to like love that and get, you got to like, get into that. So then when I go race street stock at wall stadium with Richie Monjo and my dad, I appreciate it so much more. When I go to the indoor races with my friends after doing, you know, every cup race on the schedule all year long grinding, it's fun. I go there and we make our car better because we're working together. Mm-hmm. We're going to dinner afterwards. Like that's, that is, it's ref- I'm like, this is why I do this. Is the pressure off you? For, no, for stuff like never. that or well compared to you know being at a cup race where you got to perform and all that and there's corporate entities involved and then you go run a street stock race somewhere yeah it's it, all it's, but it's, i've never cried after a cup race we lost the cup championship in 2020 mm-hmm. and i wanted to cry but i didn't i lost a street stock race at turkey derby with like two to go and i like Oh, I had to stop myself from wanting to cry because I was so close to win. I've always wanted to win the street stock race at Wall Stadium. <laughs> Just because I'm a street stock kid. I won the next week, which was the bigger race. But I was like, man, I haven't been this upset in forever. And any chance, any time that you strap into a race car, you can look like a fool, dude. You can leave there, especially now, with like Insta like viral on the right. internet. The way Looking social like media is, I know. So if you just right. go to have fun on a street stock race, right? You can be the clown on social media in an hour. So it's like, you're always putting yourself out there. Mm-hmm. You're just, when you get strapped in a race car, we call it roll down the hill because there's a hill at Wall Stadium. When I roll down the hill at Wall Stadium, you are opening yourself up for judgment. And if you don't like that, you need to find someone else to do. This show right here. Yeah, the hate messages that I get. You guys yeah. have no clue what you're talking about. You don't know what you're thinking, yeah. you know, you, all that. Like, I am a, a, a huge, I, 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 and I fight with people on social media about this. I hate the whole Rubbins racing thing because they use that excuse for bullshit reasons. Because 
Second place will go into the corner and blast the leader out of the way on the last lap, and they'll go, oh, Rubin's racing. No, you punted the guy on the last lap. You weren't yeah. rubbing with him. You fucking hit him. Yeah. Yeah, and like that stuff took care of itself back in the day. But like I got spun out coming to the checkered, the Gambler's Classic this year by a 15-year-old kid. Mm. Right? But like for me, that was like obviously the first, like you drove from 11th to the lead in the Gambler's Classic driving away. Catch lap traffic, get spun out, come to the checker. But what? So what? What are you gonna do? Get out and act a fool? Right. Everybody would expect you to, right? Right? But like, thank God I've been at working for Roger Penske for a decade, and I go, okay. You got to keep your emotions. This in is right, but but also like being a good human, right? That's when people are. That's when the most eyes are on you. Mm-hmm. That's when you make the biggest impact on the kid in the grandstands, mm-hmm. right? You handle it with grace, mm-hmm. you know. What's it? What is it gonna do well for that fifteen-year-old kid if I run up to him and start screaming and yelling and cussing? He knows he messed up. He looks like a fool, dude. He just spun spun out the leader, mm-hmm. lost himself the championship, spun out the leader. What good is that gonna do? If I, he learned. He's gonna learn. I had to learn that lesson when I was young, the hard way. It sucks. It learned it on. He sucks. He learned it on me, right? If I get the chance, I'm gonna smash him out of the way next time, <laughs> right? But like. But I look, I can get as rough as anybody behind the wheel. Yeah. I know I can, mm-hmm. that, but I try not to. But like, there's also times where like, I need that spot. <laughs> so I, I can't sit here and say that like, I've never, like, I, I don't, I mean, rubbing is racing. I, I don't, it's a, you know, Days of Thunder line. And I, I like Days of Thunder. I don't. It's, a, it's a line from a movie. So we quote Days the of ba- Thunder Okay, here's bit. the other thing that drives me nuts about Days of Thunder. Days of Thunder Great movie. It was a great popcorn movie. It was a Tom Cruise action flick, all of that stuff. Loved it. The worst part is the message that it sent, which is the Rubbins racing, and it taught an entire generation of kids to drive like assholes. Yeah, but the... but the, Because now you go to any late model race, you're expecting the leader to get punted on the last lap. Yeah, but like when you look at... And that was guys- booed. And, and you were frowned upon for years, you know, if you pulled shit like that at the track. Yeah, but if you go back in time in the Roman Coliseum, right, they would cheer for that type of stuff back then. You well, know, your life was on the line yeah. back then. So well, but, it's a but different in the, in the '90s, though, <laughs> in the '90s, life was on the line, right? Like, yeah. I've been on the racetrack; people got killed, man. It's not fun. No, me too. I've been and there. thank God for people like the joyous seating, right? Yeah. And and Butler and Hans Device, Bobby yeah. Hutchins, Bell Helmets. You mm-hmm. know, like, thank God we've come so far that you can race like an asshole and not worry about getting hurt. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, but that's opened up a whole nother window because like when you look back and you really watch those races from understanding, there was like from understanding where these guys are coming from and why they're mad, they could get seriously hurt, killed. Mm-hmm. If you, and I'm not saying that can't happen nowadays, but it's not happening like it did. It still doesn't make it right to be it able doesn't to make put it you right. in the fence. I know it doesn't make it right, but it's opened up the window and when I'll use indoor racing, perfect example. Mm-hmm. Indoor, and you're a midget guy, you're a NEMA guy, mm-hmm. right? NEMA's club, just like ATQ Murray. Mm-hmm. Everybody kind of races with etiquette. It takes one guy. Who was the one guy indoors that changed the whole thing? You'd go indoors, you'd watch Lusaconi and Joey Payne run side by side, the Gambler's Classic checker flag. There's a one guy that came in there and changed the whole deal. He sold the most tickets out of anybody. We talked about him earlier, Teddy Christopher. Yeah. He went in there, he changed the whole game. So you got rough and everybody got rough because you had to be. Yeah. Right? And the, that the Gambler's Classic is a barroom brawl with cars. Now it is, but it yeah. wasn't that. Yeah. It wasn't that. When Louis, I mean, Lou, if you watch Lusconi try to pass, he was faster than Joey Payne in one of the Gambler's Classics that Joey won and he tried to pass him clean. And like the older I get, and that was my message to, to Tanner Van Doren was, hey, man, I, I understand what you've watched. I get it but we're working hard to not make it that anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. So like that's your one. We're not smashing anymore. Like, and I, and I, w- there's one thing of like, you can get in there and push each other around cause it's small, but the, the, well, those deals, the bashing that that's like, uh, look, I, I'm going to, I, yeah, I, I'm going to lean on you. We're going to lean on each other to get a better angle off the corner to get in the rubber. Cause you have to in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, and I, I look, I've, I've, I've gotten to a dark place to win some races before with my front bumper, <laughs> but um, I am uh, 
indoors now, I find I found that my car's fast enough to where it's a hindrance when I hit the guy in front of me. Mm -hmm. Like it slows me down. Mm -hmm. And then it tells them I'm there, so they start running defensive line. So like I want to try to set you up and pass you without you even knowing I'm there. Uh, so that, and that's been, that's because just, if they know you're there, they're going to give you a hard time. Yeah. But that just comes with maturity. Right. right? You can't, you gotta, that's, you're going to get there eventually. You gotta, you're not going to, I'm not going to expect a kid in their twenties to be as mature as a guy in their thirties. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, I don't know. Right. But racing, it comes back to the promoter and being consistent. And if you're not going to allow that stuff and don't, you know, don't allow it. That was going to be my next question. Don't, you know, part of it also falls on the tracks and the officiating because if they let that behavior get out of hand, they're going to do it. You know, if you show these kids and these drivers right at the beginning that if you take someone out or, you know, wreck somebody, you're going to get punished for it. I mean, that's the way it should be. Yeah. It's tough racing against kids. What drives me nuts though at Bowman Gray is you watch guy lead the whole race until the last lap and then coming out of four, second punts him, you know, the guy in second wins the race, jumps out of the car like he did something spectacular. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's just, that's the nature of that place. I, I get it. That. And, and I, but, but that's, that's kind of pertinent to there, right? Like I, I don't, I, the gambler's classic, I won Timmy Buckwalter spun out off of my bumper, right? I didn't spin him out on purpose. I got smashed from behind, but I, it was the most conflicted I've ever been in victory lane because Mark Laffler helped me own that car, right? Mm-hmm. And I, the, and I raced with Timmy Buckwalter my whole life growing up. Last thing I want to do is spin. But you out. got shoved into him though. Got I mean, it was just a big stack and he ended up spinning. Okay. Right. And I win the race. But like, dude, if I win the Gambler's Classic at that point, I'm just gonna change my life. Mm. You know the celebration I'm gonna do? Do you understand? I'm gonna climb in the grand. I'm gonna do all this. I've been thinking about this for years. Mm-hmm. And I win at Parker Victor and then I feel bad getting out of the car. That sucked, dude. Yeah. I, I don't wanna you know, like I don't wanna spin somebody out and win like that. But like there's also times where like I've gotten in them just smashing matches with Andy J. Like, all right, how how are we gonna do this? You know, because I'll whatever whatever way you want to do it. We'll want to run into each other. Let's run into each other. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that, I look when I say Rubin's racing. Look, I understand contact is gonna happen out on the track. Granted, you don't like you people know, smashing into each other. I mean, and I don't mind out. guys leaning on each other and stuff like that. But if if I go in the corner and I just get a shot from behind and sent up up the track and lose four or five spots, that's just dick driving. Yeah. You know, that drives me nuts. Did you like what Teddy did, though, with his career? What's that? Did you like how, what Teddy did? No, I never agreed with the way Teddy <laughs> drove, and I told him that, too. Yeah. I didn't. That wasn't my way. I, I, just, I've always appreciated the guys that can turn it on and off, right? Like, I'm not... I'm, I like a guy who can get... I like a guy who can pass without being able to hit or make contact. or Like, yeah. okay, first, Noki Fanoro. Noki Fanoro can get through a pack like a hot knife through butter and yeah. not touch a single car. You have to in those... Yeah, you can't hit each other and name a midget. That's a good way. <laughs> you to shouldn't end be up doing it in a TQ either, though. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. But they used to run the TQs up on the banquet wall, and they were stupid oh, I was there. fast. I was there. I lived it. I watched it. I watched John take one out one night and then park it and be like, "I'm good." Um, I mean, that's Joey Payne had a mullet back then, and John used to call it the TQ mullet <laughs> back then. But uh, but yeah, Joey and Johnny and the. Uh, it was Tim Adams. The guys were badass, dude. Oh yeah, no, I I know. Believe me, I got to race with some of those guys over the years. I ran. I want. TQ's I wish I went to that. Was it Pinebrook? Or Pinebrook. Yeah. I wish oh I got God. to do that. That's like See, right in my wheelhouse. That would have been right in your wheelhouse. Because well, I mean, look at the guys that came out of Pinebrook that ran so good, man. You know, Joey Coy, Joey Payne, uh, Noki Fanoro, Drew Fanoro. I mean. The place was the place was essentially Bowman Gray for TQs. I'm sure Lenny Boyd's sick of me calling. I just, sometimes I just call to talk to Lenny Boyd. Yeah, because like Len, dude, Lenny's stud. Yeah. Lenny won them races. Lenny's been there for all of it. Yeah, and you like, won the race of champions too and I, modified. I'll walk up to Lenny sometimes and be like, "Hey, when like," and, and that's where people don't understand. They think it's different, and mm-hmm. they almost think like there's almost like a condescending nature to us now. Like we know better than the guys did back then, mm-hmm. but I'll be like, Hey Lenny, when the tracks rubbered up like that, like, did you ever like have to charge it, like drive in harder to get through it? He's like, yeah. He's like, you had to charge, you got to charge that rubber. You can't try to roll through it. And like that type of stuff, he knows. And he'd come up to me and goes, you got to figure it out. Like there'd be times you got to figure out. He'd be like, Hey, I do that. And Lenny Boyd's been there and done it. Mm-hmm. The cars were different. They might have been slower. Track might have been different, but it's the same things apply. And he knows, man. Mm-hmm. 
So, and the key, those guys have the keys to it. You just got to ask them. They're not going to tell you. So this year, this is more than likely your busiest year as far as racing goes because you weren't one of those guys that races every week. You raced when your schedule allows. Now you're racing every week. Uh, how much of a change is that for you? Yeah, every couple of weeks, we, we're doing all the 100 lappers right now. Um, and everyone that kind of fits in our wheelhouse, like this week, we're going to, like, as we film this, we're going to Wilkesboro. So I have to be there for the heat races on Saturday. So we're not going to run. And <clears throat> they're testing, getting ready for Franklin County. So our next one will be June 1st, but it's been so much fun. Like, that's the thing is, like, in the indoor car, I have to get back in there in January. And, like, it's always like, you remember how to do this? You you know what you're doing? Right. Maybe you forgot. <laughs> There's always that whisper that comes in. And, uh, yeah, to just be able to stay behind the seat, like I said, and it's when I'm my happiest. So it's been really good. And now... I mean, you're turning into one of these jack of all trades because going over the wall, the modified, the midget, the the TQ, and now you're doing on air stuff. So how do you go? Uh, how do you go from doing all that to now trying to mold into an on air personality? Feel the fairground started all that, right? Like I would never all those been videos in, you guys. Well, did. but I've never been in front of the camera until then, right? Yeah. They featured us on Race Hub. We had Brett Bortle out there. Three Wide Life was out there. They were all filming. And like you go back and watch, I remember um, watching the first Field for the Fairground video that came out and being embarrassed because I was so nervous and I talk like this and I, you know, like that's how I was. And I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta work on that, uh, right? I remember walking around with interviewing people, and, yeah. and, and announcing those races. But we would have, we were, we were doing satire, really. But we were having so much fun. But it, like, but it was like, it was like a, it was like a small boutique racing circuit like it had everything there that you could want it had media like you were there right you, you your big face I, <laughs> especially you, get, you were doing mb what were you doing nbc then uh, Fo uh fox and nbc yeah so you were there and every cup driver tony stewart was there <laughs> right lauren rainier had his cards kevin swindell had his like mm -hmm. every everybody who was anybody was there it was the I thing back, to do did i look back at the pictures you know who was there driving my cart one night? Pat McAfee. From a Pat McAfee show now? <laughs> right, right. He was driving my cart. He came there with the Three Red Life guys and kicked the football and hung out. He still follows me on Twitter today. No kidding. Yep, but like he was even there. Richie Evans Jr. was racing there. Like I know. we got the two classes. Like that started as fun. It became like a job. It became it became real because I remember almost some fights breaking out there a few oh, nights. Oh, yeah, but like <laughs> do you... Like the bonfire in turn two. It, it, yeah. It, yes. So I about lit, I about lit Corey on fire in that one time. It was bad. <laughs> How'd you do that? Uh, we had this, I lit the cardboard on fire um, and he was making, he had like made a line, but he went to go through something. I'm like, I gotta throw this in there. My, it was burning my hand. And like, instead of just throwing it away from the fire, I'm like, I gotta go. And I threw it into the fire and it like sucked all the oxygen out of the air. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> He still talks about that quite a bit. He's like, "What? What was that?" I'm like, "I don't, I don't know how my brain was, New Jersey public school brain was wired there, but I, it was my only option. I don't know why that was the only thing that was. There was a lot more options, but that was the only one set in my brain. So we were lucky to get out of that with any eyebrows. Oh, um, we might have lost all the hair in our arms, but uh, but yeah, I mean, we we just like a lot of kids when they're 21." 20 you know even you talk about 25 right like you're partying drinking doing it not us man we we're building go-karts field fair fairgrounds right. and, and it was fun because we were working on Corey's can and he's it was just such an exciting time right like i wanted to be a tire changer i was just working in the fab shop at rouse trying to mm. just figure it out and Corey was um trying to you know drive and he, he was even crew chief in some cars then and just building we were building race cars and brandon mcreynolds running uara and coleman presley and bubba wallace right mm -hmm. like all these guys it was just nobody had made it yet right all trying to just in our respective lanes just growing up and figuring it out and we we're doing it in front of a camera at the field for fairgrounds right and it was just so cool like we got to go back and pull some of that footage up but <laughs> it really was like for me because I always wanted the opportunity to race and have that. I never had that. Right. And it was like, a, it was a big deal for me. Like I used that as an opportunity to learn and grow and like, oh, hey, I watched that back. I got to be better at talking in front of the camera. I got to slow down. 
watch the oh I can my race car needs my little go kart needs this right yeah. like we'd be back there and I remember Corey we I remember when they Randy pulled that there's a shed back there the, the track's gone now but Randy pulled the door up on the shed and there's a bunch of go karts and they're like let's build these things so we all had old LaJoy seats on them. Like right. I remember and, some go karts with a high back seat. Yeah. And it was just like, <laughs> Hey, we're going to have fun. Right. And then like Corey got the first set of yellow Vega tires and we all had them. Now it's not. And then, then I remember Corey was like, no, nah, my motor's got like, what valves you got? Nothing. Oh, they're stock. There's it's nothing. It's nothing. And I walked, Wayno was working there and Wayno had the top off of his motor and I looked at it and the valves must've been out of a big block Chevy. I was like, oh my God. So like I took my motor apart, right? And I'm knife edging the cam and grinding it down and lightening it like myself with a grinder. No idea what the hell we're doing. And, you know, we were, it was, but like when I look back at it right then, we were just fabricating, but like we were learning, we were learning how to build motors, we were mm-hmm. getting pistons, rings, you know, doing all that stuff, clearance in the head, decking it, like doing all that, all that fun stuff that like everybody had to do in the, 70s 60s you know it was like but it it accelerated just like cup racing had where it started like that Mm -hmm. and then it was like go-kart teams coming in manufacturers guys when the leather jackets would show up like the state champions that's when you knew it was like oh okay yeah this is different and it it was it was a lot of fun and you know unfortunately you got too fast and too big and then it was like all right we got to stop doing this it was a shame the field filler fairgrounds went away but you know that was one of the things that I always admired about Corey, you know, when uh, he was coming up through K&N and all that, is that he was working on all of his own stuff. Like, he wasn't, like, one of these kids that were in a, in a, in a, a hired ride where they would just sit at the end of the trailer and play on their cell phone. Like, he'd go get out of the car and grab wrenches, you know? No, I, I, can tr- I attribute a lot of my success to being friends with him, mm-hmm. right? Like, he found a way to make it happen. Yeah. I still have to like, dude, cup race and beat you down. It's oh. so hard. And like, I still have to remind him of that. Like, Hey, remember you live under a microscope, like, but, but like, remember you're a badass, dude. Remember you can do this. Remember what it took to get here. You've been down and out worse than this. Mm-hmm. And he was, man, he was down and out plenty of times. Everybody thought his career was over mm-hmm. and just, just through grit and <laughs> just working and, and figuring it out and building it and, hauling race cars around and crew chief and other guys cars like whatever he had to do to get back in the seat i did put it. Corey. i tell you i'll put Corey's driving talent up against you know someone like kyle larson's any day because that one year where he ran the k&n race uh jesus he and kyle were side by side for at least what 10 15 laps remember larson it, told it, me at new hampshire yeah larson I mean, told me that yeah that he cory bottomed out getting into one or getting into three and that's how kyle beat him because they were side by side Plenty of times that year, and Corey mm-hmm. won six of them. Yeah, where it was him and Kyle. Yeah. He got he got the better Kyle. And Kyle, I remember telling that me, was so much fun that year because you guys operated on like one tenth of what everyone else had. They yeah. were all pulling in in big eighteen wheelers, and you guys come in with a fifth wheel, and you still. Kick if I ass. was if I was um, more mature back then, I I don't I think Corey would too. We wouldn't talk about it as much, like. Look what we're doing with you guys got a cup team. Look what we're doing. Like we were probably a little bit too brash where people were like, these guys need to shut the hell up. But um But you guys you guys proved it on hey, the track though, man. Every time I've never you guys seen a hauler win a race. That's right. You guys proved it on the track, you know. Five wins that one year, almost won the championship. And we had Randy on and I asked him about that. Oh, he's still pissed off about that car I, I would be too. Um <laughs> yeah. Larson told me we were drinking one night fox and the hound and he said i always thought that the be- and this is right when his K&N days he said I, everybody's always i never thought anybody could shake a stick at sprint car guys but rick cory is as good as anybody ever raced against like mm-hmm. he told me that in the K&N days and that was i thought that was really cool of him to say because kyle's always been a special talent mm-hmm. and man i i appreciate those years getting to know like larson and getting to know bubba and getting to know I mean, you look at all of our friend group, right? And that's who's in the Cup Series now. Mm-hmm. Not just, um, not just like racing, but crew chief and Cliff Daniels, mm-hmm. right? Travis Peterson, Coleman Presley, Spotton, Matt McCall, right? Like he right. was. It, it's it's really cool. It's like our it's like our time, uh, you know, to to be at the pinnacle of the sport. So, yeah, that. But that K and N year was went to Bowman Gray. Uh, 
that was fun. And co- that car that we built with Corey Catfish, she actually just ran the paint scheme at Darlington. Yeah, I know. And that thing was, that know, thing was a bad memory. unit. Well, the Spire did a, a throwback video from his first win, and and I was all over the Victory Lane footage of that. And I just kind of watched that with, you know, heart, heartwarming memories and remember that day. Patrick Molesworth running out. The wooden, he had the with wooden, the wooden Dale. Dale. Yeah, <laughs> the wooden Dale. He had like a 4XL Richie Evans shirt on too. But yeah, I mean, that was... That's that was peak, um, you know, like that. That was fun. Some stuff the kids don't get to do that, man. That was fun. We had fun. That, you guys were like the real life version of Six Pack because they were all kids. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I don't think anybody on that crew was over twenty five years old. Yeah, poor right. Ron Otto <laughs> had to deal with all of it. <laughs> it was him, and then and then Dougie. Uh, yeah, Doug, dude, he was like over all of us, um, but. <laughs> Yeah, we all had chips on our shoulders. I was still working at a cup team then, too. So I didn't get to go as much because I'd travel. But. So we're, we're getting off tangent, actually, because it, it, we're getting away from my original question of how did it turn into getting uh, on all these on-air positions? Um, so Corey had a podcast mm-hmm. that he was doing called Sunday Money, and then it switched over. He started doing it for NASCAR, um, called it Stack of Pennies. Mm-hmm. And I had just said to him, like, hey, I've been talking, like, yo, we got to get a picker segment. Like, we are, there's a lot going on on pit road that, that we're not, that as a sport, we're not covering enough of yet. Mm-hmm. Like, there's, there's, uh, like, I, I would feel like sometimes we were reaching for content um, and showing, showcasing stuff that was kind of a lot of fill time. And I'm like, well, I got like so much picker information. Like, it would be so good and we won't have to fill time. Like, It'll be so good, like rankings. And, and he's like, well, yeah, let's, let's just do a picker segment. So I would call in and then um, I call in like every deal. And we started doing every podcast I call in. Then I started going down to the studio and doing it. And I went down to one because I was off work that day. And he's like, can we just, can you just keep coming? Like, that was good. Like, yeah. So then like after a year doing it, I'm like, hey, man, I don't mind coming down here, but I don't want to pay $12 to park. Every time, right? Everybody thinks you're making a million dollars. Yeah, and, I know. And I'm like, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get that figured out. So, um, yeah, so then I've kind of just been, I did the podcast, and then I just talked to um, people at NASCAR, uh, Tim Clark, who's super, that's what's so funny, because everybody goes, uh, you hear just different, Every all these racers go, oh, NASCAR, oh, NASCAR, right? They blame that. Well, NASCAR is just people. Right. Right. And they're good people. Right. And a lot of times what you're mad about, if you talk to the person, you understand it. Right. You try to understand it. But like I've gotten to meet all those people. I was in the sport for 17 years and didn't meet, never knew who Tim Clark was. Right. Mm-hmm. And he runs all the media side. And I just said, hey, this is what I want to do. And he's like, man, that's a great idea. Um, let's get you some reps. Right. So just being honest with them and telling them what I want to do and seeing where I fit in. And they've given me reps and coaching and there's great people that they have uh there now they're i call it talent i don't think i'm very talented at talking but um yeah it's it's been it's been so good to that new studio they built to be part of that and and go there and learn because really i'm not worried about being famous i just want to talk about race cars Mm -hmm. right and i just i want to it the biggest thing and logano says it all the time leave it leave it better than where you found it leave the sport better than where you found it Mm -hmm. and if i could add depth to the broadcast or to the the content when pull back the curtain of the, the really back to the initial question when we were going from five one lug to five lug nuts to one lug nut i felt like it was important to have a pit crew guy in there to explain the change because the easy thing to go is well now it's way easier right well no no no, it's not easier this is why these are the problems so i wanted to help ease that transition and if someone would get pissed off about it or we were going to lose fans because they would say, no, 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 let me show you why this is hard. Let me explain to you what's going on. That was the initial goal of going there. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been great to, to be a part of it. You got any goals on the broadcasting side no. that you want to do? Like me get in the booth, do play by play, color commentary. I, I really yeah. think Steve Latar does a great job. He does. So yeah. like if I could follow in his footsteps, that's, you know, I, just to add depth, right. No matter what I'm talking about. Cause that's the bit. Okay. And I, I'm sure you'll agree with me. That's the biggest thing when it comes to racing on television or radio is 
to know what you're talking about. Yeah. Because we have, you know, we, we do have some talent out there or people that want to do this business that don't do the legwork or learn the nuts and bolts. They just talk about what they're seeing. It's just, it's just like the picture stuff, right? Like there's, there's people that like, like me and you that know a lot about racing. Right. And then there's really great on air talent that just like the athletes that come in, that can do stuff that I can't do and hopefully mix all together and get a great, get a great product. Because like, I don't, I don't know that right now I can lead very well. Right. Like I can't, like, I don't know that I could host the show myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have, you know, we have really good people. Like thankfully Kim Kuhn is a great host and knows a ton about racing. Right. right. So I get to lean on Kim and she coaches me up just as much as, you know, anybody. Right. And, uh, and that on that around the track show and she's on MRN. So she's, she's got a better pulse of what's going on in the garage than I do because I'm an active guy, right? Like I, I can tell you why it happened and what happened because I'm in the position, but I don't know what's going on at Hendrick or what's going on at Gibbs or right. anything because I'm worried about your team. just watching the race. A lot of times I don't see anything that happened out on the race or at the race. Like this weekend when Blaney swerved at Byron, I didn't even know that happened until Monday. Oh really? Because I'm on pit road, like putting the bear bond away and yeah, like yeah. working. So I don't, I didn't see it, but yeah, I, I've dedicated my, I've lived my whole adult life in the cup garage, mm -hmm. right? 19 years old, working on the 26 Grand Royal car from building balances and side skirts and crush panels to welding exhaust, to do tires, slinging springs, changing tires, like every facet of it. And now my best friend's a driver. It's like, you know, learned kind of how that how that works and what they go through so I've, i feel like i can add to the use that knowledge and add to the broadcast and help the fan base and say because because right now especially like if i go to stafford and someone's like well, i don't watch nascar anymore well why not well because it's not hard or it's, it's, there's no competition I'm like whoa wait a minute let me explain to you but all the people that always come up to me and say well i don't watch racing anymore they're the same ones that are like I saw you miss a lug nut on lap 343. Yeah, know. You know, like, oh, okay. I thought you didn't watch. What yeah. are you talking about? Or, that was so dumb last week. Like, wait a minute. I thought you didn't watch. I'm right. confused. So. Now, we had a situation like that <clears throat> uh, last week. Some guy buzzed us on Instagram, just, just shit talking me up and down and all of this stuff. And I can't, you know, you, what are you doing talking about this? You don't know, blah, blah, blah. Two or three days later, they're commenting on another photo. Oh, yeah, this was great, and this was awesome. I remember this. It's yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, we talked about that with Bubba on Stack and Pennies a couple weeks ago, like all the noise he gets. You know, we watch Bubba grow up. Bubba's a great race car driver. He Bubba is. Wallace, say what you want. He'll come to your short track and put it on you. Like, any, like everybody needs that. I, I had this conversation with Stephen Kopchick. Perfect example. Um, but anyway, put a bow on that Bubba stuff. He said, man, a lot of people that boo me are the same guys that will ask me for an autograph at the gas station if I see them, right? And mm -hmm. he's like, yeah, that's, you know, that's just what it is. Back to our point earlier. When you strap on a racing helmet and you get out there in front of everybody, you open yourself up to be judged. Yep. Um, but uh, with Corey going back to Martinsville and he won that modified race, like nobody beat Matt Hirschman all year. Mm -hmm. Corey drove up there and drove right by him, right? And pitted and there was a wreck at the end or whatever, but Corey won that race. And I remember talking to Stephen Kopchick and I just said, the guys at that level are that good. He's like, are they really that? I said, they're that they, they have tools that you don't even know exist. Mm -hmm. right? right. Like they, they, they don't like, there's a reason Kyle Larson goes and wins short track stuff. Like there's, they are working on such fine details. It'd be like a machinist, you know, that has a tape measure or one that has, you know, the stare at tools that measure to the, you know, thousands of an inch. You know, it's it's yeah. just, a, it's a way, way different deal. Um, but you can't explain it if you've never been there. You don't know what you don't have. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the guys, the guys at the couple of them are that good. And they're racing at such a high level every week. And those are guys like you and me that came from the short tracks, but they're the ones that decided to go and race at Some the highest them. level. Yeah, Some of them. Yeah, and there's good guys like... But wouldn't you also agree, though, too, that there's a lot of guys working in the cup garage that are former drivers, good, solid former drivers, that could probably wheel a car better than a third of that field? Uh, I, th I thought that. Um, I thought that we were race car drivers and we were all created equal and we could figure it out until mm -hmm. I brought Joey Lagana to Volusia with my dirt modifier. 
Oh, yeah. And I was like, no, he's a different level. He's a different level than anybody I've ever been racing with. Not why you thought he would have a problem with I didn't think running go, dirt. I, I didn't think he'd go as fast as he did. Oh, okay. And and finished third his first night out. And you know, Strickler drove the car the same weekend. He went just as fast as Kyle. Okay. Right. He's never driven him. Right. And and at me and Savali had that talk mm-hmm. where he's like, Yeah, I always thought that same thing. We're like, Yeah, these guys, they just got the opportunity. I'm as good. No. There's stuff that there's the next there's a different level. Right. And 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 I think that that's where there's a little bit of a divide um, because I think guys think that, I think guys that, I think they run, you know, win a couple of races at Stafford or a couple here or there um, that kind of get shafted in the NASCAR side. They're like, well, that guy wasn't very good. Or you're judging a guy off of what he did when he was 20, you mm-hmm. know. They're, them guys running at the front, Ty Gibbses and stuff like that, the, the younger guys even, that are running at the front of cup races, man, they're going to come to your short track and they're going to be better than you are. And that, and I stand <laughs> on that. I stand. I, and don't get me wrong. There's guys at the short track level that if they ever got the opportunities that the cup guys got mm-hmm. could be as good. Mm-hmm. But right now, if you bring those cup guys to any short track anywhere, they're they're, And I, I've witnessed it firsthand. I'm not just saying that to blow smoke. Like I've witnessed it firsthand. Mm-hmm. They just have speed right away. But to your point about guys working in the garage, like, there's great short track guys that work in the garage. Incredible like, like, talent. Our, like, and not, not even short track like, guys like Timmy Fidoa, who's our, who's our spotter or like, right. or then you look at like the car chief for the five, Jesse Saunders or even Cliff Daniels. Yeah. Right. Like Chris Gabehart. Chris Gabehart. He was an amazing late model driver. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and Matt McCall, Matt McCall, yeah. and our crew chief, Jonathan Hassler, he drove, you know, he raced at Kokomo 600s. Like the, the racers, the, the racers are good and plenty mm-hmm. in the cup garage. There, I do see a lot of guys that kind of ended up on a bad deal or are jaded with the cup schedule because it's tough. But man, I've had, I've got nothing but great things to say. I, it's been a great life for me. Um, and I've had so much fun and I've worked with, like, I've gotten to meet people that are from here to Timbuktu and back, you know, all around the country, even different, you know, even different countries, you know, mm-hmm. and, and gotten to work together. And then even like being at Penske, getting to work with, the IndyCar guys and the sports car guys getting to know them and just talking and finding common ground with racing, just kind of bench racing. Mm-hmm. It's so cool. Like I'm so lucky. And like my um, network of racers is so vast now. Like I know every, it's like, cause between changing tires and racing short tracks and having the powder coat shop, right. and being on air, it's like, I get to meet everybody. And man, what I do know for a fact is that there's some, there's a lot of people that don't see eye to eye in the sport, but there's a lot of great people mm-hmm. on every end of it. And it's it's a lot of fun to be a part of. It's great that you have the ability to be able to do that too, because like you said, it, it builds up a huge network. Uh, we're getting close to uh, the end of the show right now, but what is next for you between going and tire changing to going and driving? What's, what's, what's on the schedule next? Yeah, so tire changing, hopefully tomorrow. Hopefully by the time this comes out, I don't know when you'll post it, but hopefully it'll be Picker Challenge champions because tomorrow at Wilkesboro, we're doing the Picker Challenge. Um, and then I'm just gonna, I'm going to run for the Hills. I'm going to, tr- I want to really, really run. And I don't know if I bring my car, if I can find a ride, I really want to run the Ice Slip 300 this year. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm glutton for punishment. That's one I had circled. Yeah. Ice of 300 and Turkey Derby. Yeah. Hint, hint, any, uh, any Riverhead modified teams <laughs> yeah. that are listening to this show, uh, you know, Flores wants to run the Ice of 300. Yep. So keep it in mind. Yeah. I would love to run the Ice of 300. And then, um, I was, you never run Riverhead, right? No, but okay. that's okay. I it's like another the, short I like track. the small stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the bull rings. And I had, I had fun going to Stafford too. Uh, the first time I went to Stafford, I was like, why? There's so much room here. Was you run an SK there? I ran SK and it was like, I ran one of Rocco's SKs for uh, Tick Mike. It was so much fun. JJVC hooked me up and it was but like the first time on the track. I was like, I don't know where to go. <laughs> there is too much room. <laughs> where the hell am I supposed to be? And Frank Rocco's like, yo, where are you running? I'm like, I trying to figure it out. I don't know. It's like being on a eight lane highway and I don't know what exit I'm taking. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, to run Riverhead and then Turkey Derby. And then we'll run some at Bowman Gray. Um, once September comes around and it's playoff time and it's playoff time. Right. I'm locked in until we get knocked out of the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I'll, that's why Bowman Gray fits well. Season starts a little bit late and ends a little bit early. Okay. 
Uh, so that works good. And then I'll just, if there's fun races that come up, like we did the street stock race in North Wilkesboro a couple of years ago with Carl Fredrickson mm -hmm. from Spiel Illustrated, like that type of niche fun stuff. Do you still like, have that car? Oh yeah. Where do you keep all yeah, of these cars? I the Patrick shop. I ran it at, you wouldn't know. I ran it at Hickory <laughs> a couple of weeks ago and got two, got lapped twice by some Camaro. <laughs> I was like, what are we, we are outgunned here. So you can take that street stock and go anywhere? Uh, yeah. I, we could take that thing to Stafford. It's got, I got a sweet open trailer with a tire rack. Nice. It's you sweet. do it the old fashioned way. Yeah. Huh? When I go street stock racing. Yeah. It's that's, perfect. That's I made cool. it like where my toolbox rolls on there. So I don't know. Like I don't really have many goals right now. I'm like having fun living. So I just want to get better at the broadcasting thing. So that way when my tire changing career is over, I have a, uh, I have a good opportunity to, to be able to keep talking about racing and maybe go race a couple of races a year myself. Well, maybe one time we'll get you on pit road or uh, we'll get you in the booth or something. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Wherever I can help. So. Well, dude, I want to thank you for coming on before we go. Is there anything that you want to plug uh, the shows, the powder coating company, you know, where you can find yes. uh, your stuff when, when stack and pennies is on and all that. Yeah. So stack and pennies is on. Uh, you can find it any week on any social media or any, uh, um, podcast platform, mm -hmm. uh, social media at stack and pennies. We have a YouTube um, full YouTube show comes out on Wednesdays. Uh, that's the best way to watch it because we digest a lot of uh, videos, but also Sirius XM channel 90 um, Tuesdays, two o'clock, I believe. And then around the track Wednesdays, it comes out. It's really good um, to talk with Kim about all the things that are coming up that weekend. It, it brings you from the short tracks. It, it just gives you a rundown of everything that you're going to see that weekend from the short tracks uh, to cover a lot of cars tour, modified tour. Then to the cup races to if you're going to the cup race, what's going on at the racetrack gives you a breakdown of the things, the concerts you can see. And, and uh, there's also a fantasy segment and a betting segment with uh, Erica that they do. Um, so it's it's really it's really a good show. I, I push everybody to watch around the track there on Wednesdays on YouTube. And then, uh, yeah, the Derek Bernsigli show. I love this, man. <laughs> I Tell you Thank what, you. I, I, I appreciate that I'm, coming from you because, yeah, we're trying to build this show up and uh, we're trying to get more and more interesting guests and get the show out there. Yeah, it's been it's been great um, for me. Like, I love Clyde McLeod. <laughs> I love Joey Payne. Right. I I I, I really liked the conversation with Jamie Tomano. <laughs> um, because I'm a Jersey guy and I remember when that car fell off the trailer with Satch. Oh yeah. shit, sir, our car's gone. <laughs> uh, you know, and that story just lives in legend and to hear Jamie tell those stories and the racing he's done. And like, you listen, like I said, uh, yeah. those guys hold the keys, man. We're going to have Jamie back on. Oh my God. He was so Dude, it's so funny. Him oh. and like, when I was like little kid, uh, through Hot Pockets, I met them and man, it's just a, nobody can tell a story. Oh my God, where's the car? You know, it's just like, <laughs> They're, they're, it's so good. Um, and I so, got to get you, Hot Pockets, and uh, like Corey on here one oh, day. Or Corey and Casey, too, because Casey lived it. Uh, Casey's as well. still there. Casey's yeah. still on pit road. You I know, know. work for Good Colin. for him, too, man. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, yeah, the powder coat shop, flow coating. But I do have, I would push everybody because I'm just like you did telling stories of short track guys. I'm trying to tell stories of picture guys. So I have a good one coming out around Charlotte Week mm -hmm. um, with me and Mike Trower. It's okay. going to be on uh, NASCAR.com and to get in behind the scenes of a rainbow warrior and a guy that changed the sport and talking about leaving the sport better than where he found it. He revolutionized the tire changing game, five championships, four day, 500, Winston million three, you know, like just two pick crew challenges, everything he's done. You get to hear a little bit about that. And I just love going back. Like when I can't sleep at night, going back and watching like the old rainbow warriors or, Kirk Shelmerdine, that type of stuff. So yeah. if we can, just like you're doing here, tell the stories yeah, and, and, and let people know how, like why, why, what you're watching today, how we got there. Cause that, those guys are the ones that got us there. Mm -hmm. Well, dude, thank you very much for coming in. Yeah. Really thank appreciate, you. appreciate it. it. It's been and fun. Uh, yeah, good luck this year. We're going to keep an eye on you at uh, Bowman Gray and Hey, any crew guys that you think would be great guests on the show, send them our way too. Yeah, and don't be yeah. surprised when I win anymore, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to be surprised. It's not, it's not going to be surprised. Here's the thing. If you win, I'm not going to be surprised. Because be impressed, not surprised. I, right? I, That's dude, it. <laughs> I, know you, I know you can wheel the shit out of a car. So Appreciate for it. For sure. That's Ryan Flores. He joins us here in the studio. want to thank all of you for joining us. And remember... Follow us on our social media channels. You can follow us on YouTube and on Facebook at the Derek Pernasiglio Show. We are on Twitter, 
Instagram and TikTok at Real DP Show. And then, of course, uh, just keep it up with us with any guests that we have on here, our clips, our shorts. And we want to thank all of you for joining us. And as always, we'll see you the next time. Bye. <laughs>